Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I'm Adrian Ford, and we're here for a short story discussion, which will go, of course, in the short story discussion playlist here on the channel, uh, inching towards the 25 mark, 25 short story discussions. Not quite there yet. Um, also, real quick, if you are in the mood to enjoy other things that I may have said on the internet. There is a link to my personal channel to be found in the description below. I am inching ever closer to the 1,000 mark there. And if you are the 1,000th subscriber, I will appreciate you evermore. Now, we are here for a short story from Sherwood Anderson, uh, which is a name that sounds extremely inappropriate if you say it slowly. Sure would. And her son. Sounds awful. That's just awful. Now, I was only able to find this on the interweb in PDF format, which I've got to be honest with you guys, I'm an idiot. So I have no idea how to copy paste a PDF into Microsoft Word. It comes out as one giant paragraph every time. So if you have any hints for me on how to do that, I, I sure would appreciate it. Now, the short story in question is called Stre The Strength of God. The Strength of God. Sounds very serious. The Strength of God. Now, what happens in this short story? Well, we are, we are concerned with Reverend Curtis Hartman who is a decent, hardworking man. Uh, he's well-to-do and about as pious, to begin with, as could be expected. If he suffers from anything at the beginning of this short story, maybe it is a bit of social anxiety and or a lack of confidence, as he finds it necessary to concentrate the entire week on nothing but his Sunday sermon so that he will get it right. And there are hints, a little bit of hints, that maybe maybe his life suffers a little bit because of that. Right? Maybe he's working too hard on something that uh, he could probably get away with, a little less concentration and a little more livening it up, right? We get that sort of impression of this, uh, I guess he's middle-aged, he's 40, so he's not a young man. Um, 40s young though, right? Still, kind of? I mean, a little bit? Uh, where was I here? Uh, Sunday sermon. Uh, he even spends Sunday morning, uh, in a room by the church bell tower praying for the ability to better serve God through his sermon. Please, God, don't let me screw this up. Something like that. I mean, not exactly that. I'm, uh, sort of compromising what it was that he would pray, but something close to that. The bell tower comes complete with stained glass, uh, including, well, but there is a small bit of stained glass that is broken out. It is uh, broken out from the shoe in the scene depicting a boy in awe of Christ. It's missing at the boy's feet. And Hartman notices that through that window, he can see into a bedroom across the street. Through that little broken shard from the boy's foot, he can see directly into a woman's bedroom. That bedroom across the street belongs to Kate Swift. Kate Swift, who likes to lay in bed wearing very little, as one might do, in their own bedroom, the privacy of her own bedroom, reading novels. Good God, novels, reading novels. No. Um, now, anyway, very, inter very interesting interpretation for this short story coming. So, uh, at least I believe so. Not to uh, toot my own horn, but to toot. Wearing very little and reading novels, Hartman castigates himself for noticing her. Uh, and he ruins, in his castigation, his own sermon. Uh, he bumbles and fumbles all the way through it that Sunday, and he hates himself more, even more, afterwards when he cannot stop thinking about her. 
so he finds himself visiting the bell tower at all hours trying to catch more and more peaks of this attractive lady across the way reading her naughty literature. We don't know that it's naughty literature, but any literature except for the Bible is sufficiently naughty enough to be naughty to Curtis Hartman. Uh, eventually, it drives him mad, and he goes to the bell tower one snowy late night all the way after 9 p.m. How naughty. Forgetting even to put his shoes on, and as he is shivering and doing whatnot in the bell tower, he has a breakdown. He breaks down. And the end of the story makes it a little bit unclear whether he abandons the life that he has been leading or whether or not he lets it push him into the sort of um, hellfire and brimstone sort of Christianity that is pervasive sometimes. <clears throat> we don't know. But here's one thing we do know. So I get this. I got this short story from American Short Stories, aptly named. Uh collected and edited by Joyce Carol Oates. And in the run-up to this short story, we have a little bit of biographical information on Sherwood Anderson himself. Where is it here? Anyway, Joyce Carol Oates, in, in, in compiling these short stories, what, what Joyce Carol Oates attempted to do was pick some very important authors and highlight some of their lesser-known works and add a little bit of biographical information in the meantime. And one of the things that she notes about Sherwood Anderson, I cannot find it, is that he had a mental breakdown around middle age uh, and went from being a businessman to being an author, which is about as lowly as it gets. Now, here's the interesting thing. We are told, very surely here, that Kate Swift is 30 years old. Reverend Curtis Hartman is 40. 30 years old. 30 is an interesting number in Christianity. 30 is an interesting age in Christianity. Do you know why? Well... It was at 30 years old, supposedly, that Christ first formed his church. At 30 years old, he formed his church. At 33, he was, um, he was crucified and subsequently resurrected. So 33 is the sort of symbology that you normally get when talking about Christianity. It's 33, the age of 33, that someone suffers something and is reborn, right? Batman, very, uh, very poignantly at the age of 33, thir I think 30, he returns to Gotham. And at 33, he first dons the full Batman attire. Here, we have 40-year-old main character, Curtis Hartman, Reverend. Curtis Hartman, but it's Kate Swift, who is 30. Now, okay, maybe that's not a big deal. Maybe that's not a big deal. But we do know that when Curtis Hartman is in his the full throes of his preaching, he wonders if Kate Swift is out there listening to him. He doesn't know. He doesn't see her. In fact, the only place we ever seem to see her in this short story is in her bedroom. She doesn't necessarily seem to be of the Christian faith. Not necessarily. Right? We don't have any inkling that she is in the audience of individuals who is watching, who is adoring Curtis. Why am I messing up his name? Curtis Hartman. I keep wanting to say Curtis Jackson, different short story, by the way. Um, so, what is she doing? We have a little bit of 
interjection from Curtis Hartman himself, who says that she is reading novels. And at one point, uh, he in college did read some novels. There was some novel reading going on, but it was not important. The Word of God was important. The Bible was important. That is what Curtis Hartman I almost did it again. I almost said Curtis Jackson again. That is what Curtis Hartman, I've been listening to the 50th law on audiobook. That is what Curtis Hartman is doing, is he is setting up a dichotomy between the Word of God, the Bible, his realm, and the realm of Miss Kate Swift. Kate Swift lives in the world of the secular, lives in the world of the novel, lives in the world of fiction. So we have the Bible versus fiction. And we have the man of God, Curtis Hartman, who is tempted by the church of fiction. The church of lust, of sex, the church of fiction, the church of all those things which the human experience might be if not dictated by, by the forever after. Now, one other thing to note, this short story was, I believe, published in 1919, though I, some places it said 1909 or 1906, I can't remember now, but uh, it seems that it was in a collection in 1919. Maybe it appeared as a short story in a publication in 1909. I, I can't be sure. I, I wasn't able to find that information, but 1919. A 30-year-old woman, unmarried, would have been approaching old maid territory. That's not my term. That's not something I endorse. I'm just stating. In that world, 1919, over 100 years ago, a single woman at 30 was probably in a little bit of life trouble. It would have been a lot more difficult for her to live her life. Now, not as difficult as it would have been, say, 20 years or 100 years before 1919, but still difficult, still not simple, still not easy to be a single woman. Here you have Kate Swift even still living with her mother. It does not say her mother and father. The short story says her mother. So, we have this great departure from life for Curtis Hartman. This great call to adventure, is it not? Call to temptation, call to sin, call to a completely different type of life. Curtis Hartman married a woman that he met in college. So you're talking at the time they were 18, 19, 20, 21. Married a woman that he had mar has been married basically. <clears throat> so he's 40. I don't know that the short story necessarily states what year they were in college. He's married a woman who is very close to him in age. And he has been married at 40, marrying a woman from college nearly as long as he was in his life not married. So we have the church, we have the married life, we have the ABCs of civilization being lived out by Curtis Hartman. He is a leader in his community, even if he's a, a bit strange and uh, stressed by the social life aspect of things. But he is a leader in that social realm, in that social dynamic. He is everything that it means to live in American society. And now we have this single 30-year-old woman who lays in bed scantily clad and reads fiction books like some sort of heathen 
starting her own church. It's like that painting from Caravaggio, I think it's called The Tax Collector, where he is calling Christ enters the the room call oh I can't remember which one of the the apostles was a tax collector, but you have Christ pointing, right? And Christ is in the dark, but you can see his halo, and his finger is in the light, pointing at the tax collector. Um, it's like that, but Kate Swift is calling to Reverend Curtis Hartman while Curtis Hartman is spying on her, creeping on her. What a weird dynamic for a short story. And, of course, Curtis Hartman at the end of the short story has a mental breakdown which mirrors, perhaps, the mental breakdown suffered by Sherwood Anderson as told to us by Joyce Carol Oates. That's what I think is going on here. If you enjoy what I do here, hitting the like button helps me out on this channel. If you find yourself here by chance but not design, I have... Mm, 25 short story discussions, many more short story reviews on the channel. I have 200 plus poetry discussions, 50 plus Emily Dickinson short or poetry discussions, 50 plus Charles Bukowski poetry discussions on the channel, all in their own playlist as well as novel read along. So consider hitting the subscribe button to stick around for more. Um, and if you want to help me out, if you really want to help me out, going to my personal channel, a link to which can be found in the description below, and subscribing over there will bring me ever closer to the 1,000 subscriber mark, and I hope to have you back for the next one.